Um, so um, my name is Ann Wright from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I run a project called Body Track. See? And the, the backstory on this is that in 1998, I went to NASA Ames Research Center, and I was um, lead systems engineer for prototype Mars rovers. And that was really great. I loved it. Uh, and then I got too sick to keep doing it. And this was all the sort of vague stuff that doesn't come up positive on any of the tests that they run you through, but yet prevents you from doing what, what you care about and what you want to do. Um, and in the process of trying to figure out what was going on there, I started tracking things. I started taking pictures of my food. Um, I started playing with, with heart rate monitors and, and scales and food logging and stuff like that. And in the end, I did actually come to a, a good result, which is that when I hit the bottom of the diagnostic barrel, the doctor I was going to, Dr. Manukian, um, very bravely said, this is a VADA imbalance in Ayurveda. You know, Western medicine can't help you, but go study Ayurveda. And when I did what Ayurveda said to do for VADA balancing, I got a lot better. And when I would go out to dinner and try to apply those principles to a menu, almost always I would have a bad reaction. And it, it took about six months to figure out to be suspicious of, of bell pepper, um, tomatoes, and eggplant. And it turns out that if you do a search on those, they're in the same family. They have neurotoxins in them. They inhibit cholinesterase. And you know, when I looked at that, I'm like, whoa, hey, this is important. So then when I added the additional heuristic, um, when I go out, don't eat nightshade. Because I was already not eating nightshade at, ho at home because the VADA balancing, does, you don't eat nightshade. Um, but once I added that additional um, heuristic, things got way better that I didn't even know were wrong. Um, and at that point, I could have gone back to the robots, but I decided that there was something important here. There was something that needed to be investigated. And I looked around for other examples of people who kind of had to run themselves differently than society said, so that they found that, that the expectations that they'd been given about how things should affect them didn't match up with their observations about how things actually affected them. Um, it turns out to be a lot of examples of this. Uh, people generally know about the um, uh, food allergies, you know, celiac disease, things like that, but that's the tip of the iceberg. There's all sorts of other ways in which uh, people react differently. Um, asthma triggers, migraine triggers, you know, weird food sensitivities, all sorts of stuff. Um, in 2009, I went to Carnegie Mellon University um, as just a, you know, a hanging on my husband, my husband was going to the Create Lab. I was just, you know, dangling along and taking classes. And I studied um, biochemistry and, and cell biology. And I found that actually, you know, at the molecular level, there's plenty of reasons to believe that these sort of differences in reaction could happen, but it's almost impossible to actually observe it at that level. So you have to still observe it from the outside. Um, and one of the things that I realized is that if you look at any given attribute, there's a distribution in the population. It's not necessarily a bell curve, but things generally have, you know, a lot of people kind of clustered in one area, and then you've got tails. You've got people who their reaction, their, their, their status on a, on a given attribute is, is, is out of the norm. Um, and if you look at, um, you know, something where, where it's obvious, so in the, in, in the case of height, you can tell this, right? And, you know, I'm... Um, pretty much average height for an American woman. My friend Steve is so far off the edge of the chart, I had to extend the, the x-axis to even show you where he would be. Um, and you can tell when you walk in a room and he's there, you're like, whoa, hey, that guy's tall. Um, and he knows that he has to modify things in order to cope with that. You know, the airplane seats are made for me, they're not made for him. But um, what we don't realize is that there's all sorts of attributes that we don't necessarily even know about where we can be outliers. And the only way we're going to figure that out is by ourselves. If you look at diagnostic tests, um, they, they set a threshold that be between abnormal and normal. But how do you know if you have a reading? Is that because you're a mutant or is it because you're you know, a person who has the expected you know, par parameters, but you're sick? They can't possibly know that, uh, especially with just one reading, which is what you usually get. And even which axes turn out to matter to you are not necessarily obvious. For me, nightshade sensitivity turned out to be the, 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 the biggest thing, uh, the biggest aha, but it's not something anybody would have ever tested for. You know, I can only figure that out experimentally. And 
you know, what, whatever it is that turns out to be important to you may be similarly obscure. How are you going to figure this out? So an example of, of uh, something that happened along this way is that I started playing with uh, heart rate monitors, and I found that when I looked at the, the norm graphs for my age, I was 31 at the time, um, for what you would expect to be you know, the, the heart rate when you're, when you're exercising, my, I got to that heart rate really, really, really easy. And then while I was going through the, the process of trying to figure out what was going on with the health, um, a doctor said, well, there's an off-label use of beta blockers, so why don't you take propranolol? And at the, the smallest available dose, it had a massive, massive effect. It was things that were, would, would send me for a tailspin were just like, it was like watching a movie. It was amazing, the difference. Um, and one of the things that I noticed is that doing the, the, you know, the exercise bike or, or things like that, it took a lot more effort to get to the same heart rate as before. Now, the story in our culture when, you, when your heart rate is high is, oh, you must be unfit. But, you know, did I suddenly become lots more fit because I took a pill yesterday? I don't think so. There's something else going on. And in the process of looking into the cholinesterase inhibitors, I did 23andMe, and I took the results of, of that, which uh, look at po single po nucleotide polymorphisms, and I ran it through something pro called Promethease that will look at your results compared to um, a kind of Wikipedia-like thing for single nucleotide polymorphisms called SNPedia. And I just happened, I wasn't looking for this, I just happened to notice that it mentioned that I had a, a SNP related to beta blocker response. And I'm like, oh, really? And I looked at it, it turns out that I'm GG on this obscure little SNP. And what they know about it is high heart rate, okay, got that. Strange results on, on by beta blockers, got that. Uh, low extroversion, uh, I see where they're, where they're going with that. Um, and the question is, you know, how common is this? Well. It turns out that on, the, that on a very SNP on, on SNPedia, you can find that out. There's a project called HapMap that has gone through and looked at uh, how many people have various SNPs. And in this case, AA is orange, GG is blue. See any blue on that graph? Yeah, neither do I. This is rare. <laughs> um, and realizing this, you know, suddenly it made sense. You know, people had been telling me all along, you know, oh, well, you're unfit or, or you know, you're imagining things, but actually, I'm a mutant. I'm a perfectly healthy mutant. And once I knew that, I knew that all of these graphs that are made for the AA people aren't about me. <laughs> and it was very freeing. And it, it's very uncommon to have sort of this crisp a result. But it, it helped me realize that, you know, when we feel like we're reacting differently to something, maybe we are. We just don't know the mechanism. It doesn't matter if we know the mechanism or not, if we can figure out strategy. And it got me thinking about the diagnostic process. And, you know, which I'd, I had gone through all the way. It, it, it felt like being a, a ball in a pachinko machine where you know, the little ball falls down and it hits various things, it bounces left or right, and it either bounces into a scoring hole or you end up in the bottom tray and you score nothing. Okay? I fell in the bottom tray and scored nothing. But the way that it's supposed to work is that you, you fall into one of the scoring holes, puts you in a pigeonhole, you get into diagnosis, and because they know about the pigeonhole, they now pretend they know about you. Okay? This doesn't work for everything. <laughs> Didn't work for me. And I was thinking about why is it done this way? And it, I think it comes down to industrial versus artisanal models. So in the industrial model, you know, you, you have some central authority that decides what's going to be produced and, you know, either that fits for you and you have, you know, really cheap stuff um, or, you know, you're out of luck. Whereas in the artisanal model, you know, you have a lump of clay, you start from first principles, you can make whatever kind of your, your, your skill and your, and your cr creativity gets for you. Um, and in an artisanal model, you don't need the, the pigeonholes. So if you look at the sort of the, the myth of diagnosis, the effect on our culture of this sort of assumption that diagnosis is everything and, you know, the, the myth of Dr. House, um, the, the idea is that, you know, either you're on your way to being diagnosed, or it's in your head, go away. Um, and so when you find yourself in the, you know, it's in your head, go away, bottom tray of the Pachenko machine kind of situation, what do you do? Our society gives us nothing to do with dignity at that point. Um, however, what I have found in looking at all this is that when that industrial model fails, there are things you can do. You can define your own axes, you can define your own scales, you can discern how you're doing at a moment, you can record in the moment what's going on, and then you can reflect using those concrete instances and look at it through various lenses and say, does this match me? 
Hmm, hey, that's looking good. I'll move that up in the ranking. Does this match? Ugh, ugh, nah, get rid of that one. And, and you, can, you, can, you can do this. And you do it in a feedback loop. Um, and if you look at this feedback loop, it's essentially the scientific process. But it's not the scientific process applied to generalizable knowledge. It's applied to very specific knowledge. If I believe this and I do this, what's it do in my life? Does it do it for me or not? Try the next thing. And, um, and it, it works very well. And if you look at all of the people who've kind of gone through this sort of process and lived their lives by a different user's manual, this is basically what they did. Um, and sort of looking at it through the lens of the potential for self-tracking, it gets you free of the diagnosis myth. It gets you free of the tyranny of the norm. Um, because it turns out that even if you have a diagnosis, it may or may not be what you need. If, you're, if you've got, you know, things that are getting triggered, what is triggering them, they can't help you with that. They can just mask the symptoms. And even if you're undiagnosed, who cares? This is a different set of dimensions. It's a different, different approach. It doesn't matter. Who cares if you're in a pigeonhole? And so, whereas in the other one, there is some other authority that was controlling what, you know, which side of that line you're on, in this, you're controlling which side of the line you're on. So how do people do this? Well, in 2010, um, these self-tracking tools started coming out and that could potentially generate data, and I started working on them to generate data. Um, and I founded a project called BodyTrack, which I still lead. And we looked at how to get the data from all these various things, including self-reported data, uh, into an explorable form. We've since merged with another project. It's now called Fluxstream. It's up on fluxstream.org. You can go make an account. We've got a couple of thousand people using it. Um, and the way it works is that the, the data that comes from various data sources that, that do it right enough, that have an API, that have cloud push, that have authentication, um, we can allow you to bind your account, and we can pull that data in, we can put it together, we can make it explorable. And in the process of doing this, what I realized is that you actually need to have new sort of cultural models for, for what to do. This is a different kind of process. It's, a, it's, it's, it's like learning to cook if you've never seen learning to cook. People, we don't expect people to do that by buying a pan, buying a knife, reading the user's manual, and suddenly, boom, they know how to cook. But for some strange reason, we expect that for self-tracking. And it's just not true. You actually need to have some sort of human interaction to kind of learn the discernment, learn the processes. And I think the really critical thing is that the process of crafting your own personal narrative is an individual process, it's an interactive process, and you can't be automated. You know, the people who believe in the great correlator in the sky is going to, is going to control us, I, I, I think they got it wrong. Um, so to give you an example of, of uh, what this is like, so when you add a connector and you can add, you know, as many of these things as pertain to you, um, it pulls the data in. You can see it in various ways. Um, you can see it in sort of a diurnal clock view, in a list, uh, in a, on a map, in a grid of photos, or on a timeline. Um, and the BodyTrack app actually is done as a, um, a set of uh, per channel kind of things, and you can explore it in, uh, fluidly in time. So you can zoom in, zoom out. Different things have different time scales that, that are important, but the relative timing can be very, very, very important for these sort of triggers. You know, did I, did I go for a walk before or after I ate the bagel? That kind of question. Now, in my case, the, the thing I most struggle with still is kind of the, you know, the IBS kind of stuff, you know, the, 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 guts, the gut wrenching. Um, and so I record that every day. And I can tell, so in this, in this graph, um, the value of four is, is happy. And luckily, the amount of, of happy has, has, has gone way up over time, which is, which is fantastic. But there's still times that thing, you know, the higher numbers are, are things going awry, you know, sort of lying there in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, um, a pile of pain. And if I go and I look at, you know, what was special about the times that things went wrong versus the times that went right, it can give me ideas about things that, that might be going on, things that might be salient. And when I look at those blips, one was my first trip to Brussels, okay? Um, the next one was, look, another trip. Hmm, maybe I'm starting to see a pattern there. Um, and I, you know, landed at midnight, um, slept during the day, went to dinner with my friends, what did I eat? This is weird. This is really weird. This is stuff that I don't usually eat. It was a weird day. And, you know, I'm kind of suspicious of this stuff, to be honest. Um, and so going through that type of process where you start from the concrete, you start from you know, the, the, the times that things went awry, and you look at it from first principles, what was potentially interesting? What was potentially different? Um, it, I think, is, is very interesting. I've been doing um, coaching with this, about an hour a week for, for different people. 
And um, I'm going to tell you just briefly about three people who, who were sort of in the first group in San Francisco that we did this with. Um, Alan was a type 2 diabetic for 26 years. He'd had two stents. It, his HbA1c's were getting worse. He was worried that he was you know, going downhill, and he felt like he was doing everything he'd been told to do. So he begged a continuous glucose monitor. He begged for the opportunity to pay his own money to buy a continuous glucose monitor, and he got hold of it, and that's what the green line is. And the, the blue is Fitbit. And he started looking at just, when I do this, what happens to my blood sugar? How do I keep it in range? And these are going on one-mile walks. And he figured out that on one, a one-mile walk, you get a transient small increase, but then over time, the next few hours, you get a decrease. And he found out that you know, if he ate the way he was told to eat, it would go whee, out of control. And if he did sort of more kind of paleo-type eating, it would stay in range. And as he got better and better at this, his weight, which is the pink line, went down. His HbA1c is it came into the back into the normal range. Um, he's doing fantastically. And it's because he has customized what he's doing not to be the one-size-fits-all stuff that he was told which, which screwed him up over 26 years, but stuff that he's actually paid attention to how it actually affects him. Um, Paul was actually the doctor in San Francisco I was doing this with. He had trouble with headaches. He was suspicious of things like caffeine and carbs and stuff. And what he actually found when he looked at the data is that those didn't seem to matter. But sleep mattered. And in particular, what he started recording through that moment that you start to kind of uh, drift off, he called it eyes close, is, that, is the, the thing he would record. And he found that if he uh, had that happen and then he pushed through, he'd have headaches. If he had that happen, he went to bed, he'd be fine. And that, you know, gave him a new way of looking at it. And Marcy had very disrupted sleep. She would wake up multiple times during the night. This is uh, Zio data, the orange is, is wake up, and, and basically every night looked like this for months. And all the things she thought might matter didn't matter. It always looked like this. And then she went to Burning Man and did a ritual at the Temple of Transition where you take symbolically the stuff, your, your baggage you've been carrying around, you invest it into a flammable item, you put it on the pyre, and the whole thing goes up in flames. And the next night, here we have this perfect, beautiful, uninterrupted night of sleep, the first time she's ever seen that happen. And it persisted. And so this gave her a completely new idea for what was important. So there was some sort of low-level vigilance thing that somehow the ritual got to. And it wasn't on the radar. And a lot of times you'll find that these things aren't on the radar. And so I, um, I, I hope that, you know, that I've, I've, I've helped sort of, you know, broaden your perspective on, you know, that the diagnosis model isn't everything, that the, the norm can be tyrannous, and that people where, where there aren't fitting in the pigeonholes, there's hope. Thank you.